If the German army of World War II was characterized by something, it was the creation of a series of elite divisions with which they intended to defeat entire enemy armies. These were units like the Leibstandard, the Das Reich, the Grob Deutschland Division, the Hermann Göring or the Elite Panzer Lehr Division. Of this unit, Guderian himself commented that with how powerful it was going to be, it alone would be enough to send the Allies back to the sea. In today's program, we are going to see the complete history of the Panzer Lehr Division, which is considered one of the best Panzer Divisions in the Wehrmacht. To do this, let's go back to November 3, 1943. At this time, increasingly intense fighting is taking place on the Eastern Front, in which the Germans are irremediably retreating. Meanwhile in Italy, they have managed to establish themselves in the defensive line Gustav, although they do not know how long they will be able to resist in it. At the same time, the Germans imminently await the great Allied landing in France, although they do not know where the exact place where they will attack will be. During the previous months, many German units that were in France, have been sent to the Eastern Front to try to reinforce mainly the German army group south of Marshal von Manstein which has led to weakening the defenses in France in the face of an Allied invasion. So during this November 3rd, Hitler issues his Directive No. 51, in which, among many other things, he talks about the need to stop weakening the future Western Front. It is precisely in his last point regarding the issue of land units, in which the German leader indicates that mobile reinforcement brigades should be created, made up of all kinds of soldiers who were not fighting at that time, including the instructors. It was like that a month and a half later, at the end of 1943, this 130th Panzer Division emerged, nicknamed the Panzer Lehr Division. The most striking thing about this unit is that from the outset it was considered an elite Panzer Division, because it was made up of instructors and professors from the two academies where Panzer crews were trained. These were highly experienced men, mostly veterans of the Eastern Front, who had been sent to these academies to train new crews precisely because they had excelled in combat. However, now they were once again called for combat. It is at this point where a great debate arises, in which we have the following question. Is it worth having an elite division on the battlefield, in exchange for removing the teachers from the academies? And it is that although we will be able to count on a very powerful unit immediately, there is no doubt that as a consequence of this, the training of the new Panzer crews will be reduced and worsened, which will have negative consequences in the long run. He left it to each one to answer this question according to his criteria. In any case, we have to say that the German plan was to repel the Allied invasion using all possible means. After this, a certain normalcy could be returned to these academies, and they could focus on the Eastern Front more calmly. Thus, if the Allied landing was successful, and they ended up making their way to Germany in a few weeks, it would hardly matter whether there were good teachers in these academies or not. The first steps of this division can be found in eastern France, specifically in the surroundings of Nancy, which was the place where the members of the Panzerlehr division began to gather. The experienced and veteran General Bayerlein was personally chosen by Guderian to command this elite division. When the two men met at the end of January, Guderian told Bayerlein the following. This unit has been created specifically to repel the impending Allied invasion of France. With just this division, you should be able to drive the enemy into the sea. Your objective is not the coast, it is the sea. These words of Guderian's indicate without a doubt the great effort that the Germans had made to create this division, and the great feats that were expected of it. However, and although its function was to fight in France when the landing arrived, due to the needs of the moment, in March of that year, 1944, it had to be sent to Austria. With this, they intended to put pressure on the Hungarian government, which, due to the great Soviet advance on the Eastern Front, was considering changing sides. Finally in the middle of the month, the division participated in the occupation of Hungary, not intervening in any combat. Next, the Panzer Lehr resumed its training this time on Hungarian soil, leading many of its members to think that they would finally be sent to fight on the Eastern Front. However, on April 29th, before the imminent invasion in France that the Germans expected, this elite division was definitively sent to France, and was located west of Paris during mid-May. Thus, 
and by chance and fortuitously, it will be one of the panzer divisions closest to Normandy at the time of the invasion. Finally, it should be noted that this was one of the panzer divisions that were under the direct command of Hitler, and could only be sent into combat under his authorization. The number of troops that the panzer lair had just before the start of the Battle of Normandy was almost 15,000 men, along with some 230 tanks, including 80 panthers, 103 panzer fours, 8 tigers and about 40 tank destroyer. In addition, it had up to 674 half-tracks, which made it a fully motorized division, with abysmal firepower and mobility. Only the 12th Waffen SS Panzer Division could compete with it in numbers. With respect to its personnel, 60% of its men were former veterans of both the Eastern and Italian fronts, which include the instructors. The other 40% were 18-year-olds with whom the division had to be completed, and who were perfectly instructed by their fellow veterans. When the Allies began their landing on the Normandy coast on June 6, the Panzer Lair was in the city of Chartres, some 170 kilometers from the Normandy coast. Although at first he did not receive the order to go there, a few hours later authorization was given for him to start his march. Thus, and as happened with many Panzer divisions of the German army, the Panzer Lair was heavily attacked by Allied aviation throughout its journey to Normandy. In total, it is estimated that they lost some 84 half-tracks, 130 trucks, and 5 battle tanks. In addition, another number of armored vehicles broke down along the way due to mechanical failures. Between June 8th and 10th, the Panzer Lair gradually reached the Normandy front line, and was positioned to the left of the Waffen SS 12th Division, just between Cannes and Bayeux. There they were able to contain the offensives that the British were launching to the west of Cannes, in their attempt to break through and encircle the city. However, that big counterattack by armored divisions that the Germans had planned to drive the Allies back into the sea, could never take place. The main reason is that all these units were arriving at the Normandy front little by little, and they had to be used desperately to block the Allied penetrations in the different places on the front. In addition, the Allied aviation crushed them with total ferocity, preventing them from being able to move and concentrate freely. Thus, after about 20 days of combat in this sector, in which the Panzer Lair was able to repel all the British attacks, their situation was as follows. It had a total of 100 operational tanks, and another 60 that were under repair, while its troop losses rose to 3,000. It should be noted that from this point on, practically no division received any reinforcement brought from Germany, because the communication routes were monitored and attacked by Allied aviation. This means that the German divisions were progressively weakened, until they were reduced to units that could no longer fight. In any case, at the beginning of July the Panzer Lehr Division was still a unit of great combat value, and was sent some 40 kilometers further west near the city of St. Lo. This was because the Americans were also launching major attacks in the area, threatening to break through at Avranche. One of his first actions upon arrival was to carry out a counterattack northwest of St. Lo, in which it became clear that the American superiority was overwhelming, and that such actions were little short of suicide. So, for the next few weeks they moved into defensive positions, and fought a hard war of attrition. During this stage, General Bayerlein declared that his division was decimated by huge artillery and air attacks, which turned their defensive lines into lunar landscapes. By the end of the month, more than 70% of his personnel were out of action. When the Americans began Operation Cobra on July 25, the barely 2,200-strong Panzer Lair, along with its remaining 30 main battle tanks, could do little to contain the offensive. Two days later, the Americans were about to break through, and the order the German division received was to hold out without giving up territory. Bayerlein's response was as follows. My grenadiers, and my pioneers, my anti-tank gunners, they are all firm in the line. None of them have left their positions, none. They are all lying in their holes, still and mute, because they are dead. And it is that for practical purposes, the Panzer Lair had ceased to exist by the end of July. After the German counterattack at Morton, in an attempt to close the gap that the Americans had opened at Avranche, the Panzer Lair ended up losing what little it had left, 
which it ended up losing during its withdrawal from the encirclement of Falaise. Thus, the old German elite division had no choice but to return to Germany to re-equip, having to start practically from scratch. Once it was recomposed during September, October and November, the Panzer Lair would participate again, this time in the Ardennes Offensive, after which it remained fighting tirelessly on the Western Front, until it was trapped in the Rebasin. In any case, this second and last part of the division, we will see it carefully in another program later, because it is certainly interesting. And well, here is this program which I hope you liked. If you want to see other elite divisions from World War II, which had much more activity than the Panzer Lair, I leave you in the description the program I did with Carlos Caballero Gerardo about the live standard. Thank you all for being part of this community, and especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and we'll see each other here as always, next Thursday and Sunday. See you soon.